Wednesday, September 18th, and we are bringing you Block Digest 199, or, wow, 191, 191, at block height 595,493. What's going on today, Rick? <laughs> you just wanted to jump right up near 200. We can hardly believe we're near episode 200, but yeah, nothing much. I mean, it's another beautiful day here in Colorado. The leaves are starting to turn a little bit, like it might be the beginning of fall. It's been some uh, been some interesting times for sure. So uh, yeah, what's been up with you, Janine? How are you doing today? Uh, well, I would just like to announce that Block Digest is now moving into the offices of the Mumble, <laughs> <laughs> our parent corporation. Yeah, I heard we got a studio get set up there. So I need to jump over to those headquarters one day. Uh, how are you doing today, Nopar? Yeah, so I, I didn't add anything to the news desk because the channel is this uh, webinar wasn't that interesting this time. Although they had the neat demo, what I've never seen their software actually working in real life. It was slightly disconcerting, but uh, nothing much to describe. Uh, however, I want to talk about the Baltic Honey Badger conference a bit because I've been just there and... Oh yeah, man! Yeah, and there were some interesting things. I uh, Nothing really adds up to, to be a story, but, uh, but, but there were some interesting things. And, and the very first thing is that, uh, Rick, your photo went viral. One of the presenters has used the Blog Digest photo as the base of his Prezi presentation, and it looked amazing. So, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Thank you. I really, really, really need to put up a website and just like put up a small print or a large print there for uh, people to uh, use because it is one of those where it's like I made that a long while back and it seems like the popularity of that thing just does it just keeps moving forward so I need to do something with that but um yeah I like it I really enjoy that people are using it I like the fact that the community uses it and you know if any of you guys out there are like oh I don't know if I should print this up print one up man it's a beautiful image so I, you know the further it spreads out there the better I like that Print it up before Rick copyrights it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the ne next thing was about Green Wallet. Uh, mm -hmm. Green Wallet 6 is adding Tor support, not only for Orbot, not only with Orbot, but also they will add it uh, as a built in Tor support. And they may be the very first application that figures out how to how to do Tor on iOS. <laughs> so that's quite interesting there. <laughs> so that's that's good news. Um, yeah, and, and, and there was actually another guy in the BTC Pay Day uh, after the Baltic Honey Badger conference who was who was also trying to, to add Tor support to his iOS app, but he just did not succeed. So So anyway, good news there. Another announcement, uh, Nicola Dorier announced the BTC Pay Server Foundation. You, you see there are two trigger words, server and foundation. <laughs> uh, they got $100,000 from Square Crypto. So yeah, we are full of good news here. Uh, 
and on the BTC Pay Day, there was a surprise presentation, and no one knew what what it was. And and for example, I was guessing that oh, it's it's going to be Jack. Jack is going to be the surprise guest. And after my presentation, I asked them that. Uh, so who's gonna be the surprise guest? And they said it was me. So yeah, that was disappointing. There, <laughs> it wasn't Jack. All right, uh, and now I give something to Shinobi. Can you imagine the BTC Pay day started with a Windows blue death, blue screen of death? <laughs> Good. It's what you yeah. get when you use fucking Windows. You deserve it. And now I gave something to you, but I take away something to you from you too, uh, because I I have to admit something, and you're not gonna like it. I have to admit that I kind of started to like Peter McCormack. <laughs> <laughs> Well, He's a you're, pretty nice uh, guy. You're banned from the show. Uh, goodbye. Oh no, nice that's so you. funny. Jeez, man, can't even bring that name up without triggering the hell out of Shinobi. I mean, like, look, I got nothing against the guy, and I bet you, if I spent a couple hours with the dude, I'd be like, hey, he is pretty cool. And yeah, I think that yeah, when Shinobi was uh, last time you were out here, I think I kept yeah turning that against you, trying to get you to go the other way on that. But I don't know if that'll ever happen. All right, Rick, it was nice knowing you. You're gone from the show. <laughs> Janine, how about you? Uh, well, I would just like to clarify. So when you said before Rick copyrights his image, technically he already has the copyright since he's the creator, but whether he wants to register it under a Creative Commons license or not and put out terms for the distribution is a different thing. He already has the copyright. He doesn't have to, have to register that. Jeez, man, the legalities of things drive me crazy. I've been working in this, like, turning the meetup into a nonprofit, and that's a bunch of legal lease head work. And it's just like to, yeah, I guess I need to do something with that. I mean, I definitely do, I guess. All right, man, but yeah, like, uh, you know, was there anything else going on at the Baltic Honey Badger we should know about? Yeah, just the very last thing that... I practiced my the start of my presentation so much and I ruined the very first sentence. I I wanted to say, do you guys still remember the scaling wars? But instead I said, do you guys still remember the privacy wars? And then I started to describe a scenario of what happened, how there was blood everywhere and how the Bitcoin Jesus has fallen from heaven and it didn't make sense because I just ruined the very first sentence <laughs> in my presentation. So yeah, that's that's the that's that's the round is my final comment on the Baltic Honey Badger conference. It, it was great. So yeah we can go into the stories. Wow. Right. Uh, no, we can't. Uh, fuck off. I kicked you and Rick out of the show. Get out of here. We'll, we'll, we'll go into the stories when, when you leave. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <Mr. Betsy. laughs> All right. So, yeah, I mean, I enjoy that discussion because I want to go to one of those uh, one day. Hopefully every year I say, well, maybe next year. Or so maybe next year. But, yeah, there has been a lot going on in the outside of the conference scene and the news and everything. And, uh, yeah, Shinobi, why don't you take us into this first story? What's what's going on in France and the German Deutsch world? Well, uh, Libra and Facebook are about to go through their next round of getting punched in the face. Uh, so they have uh, effectively an upcoming meeting with a, a large number of players in Europe. Uh, I'll get to in a second. But um, in the meantime, France and Germany um, have together decided that they will block any attempt um, for Libra to launch in Europe, uh, stating that no private entity can claim monetary power 
which is inherent to the sovereignty of nations. And they, they seem dead set on kind of putting forward the attitude and the argument that uh, this, this is not happening, end of story. But overall, um, this meeting coming up in Europe, they're effectively going to be meeting with a huge consortium of central banks uh, from all over the major players in the world. Um, they're directly meeting with the Committee uh, on Payments and Market Infrastructure, something uh, ran by and connected to the Bank of International Settlements, but all of these central banks are going to be there. And pretty much all of them are of the attitude of France and Germany, just not making outright statements like that so far. But they, they are very concerned about just the potential consequences Libra existing would have on their monetary policy. I mean, for instance, one of the, the worries in Europe is the idea that it could disrupt the, the euro and the European economy is simply by being a frictionless, uh, you know, cross-border payments alternative that also requires moving to a different currency. Um, while there's still a lot of friction involved in cross-border payments across Europe, and so, like the, this whole situation is, like this isn't just you know. They proposed this and now they've, they've stepped up to the U.S. government and Congress is mad. Like the whole rest of the world is is lining up now to go through the, the exact same kind of process we've already played out just at a national level in America. And a lot of them are starting to really look at the alternative to, you know, letting Facebook do this or letting Bitcoin take over do their own. And we've covered many times, you know, on the show, just why that would have a lot of very serious consequences for the economy, just by changing its structure in a very, very radical way. But I'm kind of more interested in in how this is going to go versus what happened in Congress. Like, are are we going to see just a, a re- point blank repetition of that and just this isn't happening or are we going to see some kind of evolution in attitude and i don't know maybe wind up with all of these central banks effectively trying to have facebook build something for them i mean there's still ultimately a a lot of, of potential ways that things could play out uh aside from Facebook actually launching a Libra that's that has no oversight or control by a government. But, you know, this is definitely not over, even though the story overall seems to be moving very slowly. Yeah, man, I was talking to somebody just the other day that was convinced that Libra was going to take over the world. And I was trying to tell them, like, oh, you know, the regulations around that like, I just don't see this thing actually being allowed to launch. But, I mean, I'm sure that there are going to be some, you know, countries that want to sort of just redraw the way that Libra is put together and, you know, push it out and push it onto their populace and become really tyrannical in the way that they govern about all this stuff. So, yeah, it's uh, as far as just seeing a couple of governments say, like, look, this isn't allowed. I mean... Yeah, I think that all these governments are going to say this isn't allowed. And, you know, it's just crazy that it took something like Facebook to sort of wake them up to what, you know, the possibilities with Bitcoin is. I mean, in this article, I wrote this, I quoted this, that no private in- entity can claim monetary power, which is inherent to the sovereignty of nations, is something uh, somebody was saying there in the EU about Libra and that coming over there. And I mean, you know, it's pretty accurate but i mean that's what bitcoin's been doing for a long time now and uh you know we'll see how that plays out because like we were saying in the last episode or the episode before that where we were talking about cipher trace building that application for the fatf and uh exchanges and you see this sort of 
you know, yeah, maybe alliances sort of forming as far as the way that they would like the roadmap of their sovereign monetary policies being drawn up. Maybe that does involve some Zuckerberg, Zuckbucks, and some weird form amalgamation of the cipher trace tools and that sort of network. But yeah, it's, I mean, you know, it's a slow going story, but I mean, like I'm just talking about Bitcoin or crypto with people on the streets. This guy just ran, he ran up to me and talked about how like, yeah, Libra is going to make it. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it's, it's just like, what what's really like standing out to me though, as far as the whole dynamic with, what's what's going on in Europe is you know like I said the reason a lot of the these central banks in Europe are worried about Libra isn't entirely like the monetary policy I mean they're they're definitely aware of that like that's a major concern but it's the the fact that in Europe people might move into something like Libra because it's a good payments platform for cross-border payments and you know those monetary issues don't become a problem until people actually come in and start using it at a large scale and so like they're still in some way focused on like faster cheaper payments like that's one of the things um like uh mr what was his name um curie um i forget exactly which institution he's from but he's calling this a wake-up call for governments and central banks uh, which need to work on technologies to make consumer payments faster and cheaper. And it's just, it, it's, it's, it's crazy the kind of long-term dynamic I see setting up here is, you know, we've gone over how central banks creating a digital currency would just have massive disruptions in the financial system. It would completely change how debt works, how the entire financial services industry works, because the, the central banks would step in and directly compete with that in, in doing an open cryptocurrency. And like that would completely crash the economy. And it's it's just really interesting, like the potential that like they wind up trying to just build the the B cash cheap payments blockchain and wind up crashing the economy in the process. And that's the catalyst that just starts kicking off a huge migration into Bitcoin. <laughs> that would be interesting. It's hard to say what is going to be the catalyst at this point because, I mean, there's just so much going on right now where, I mean, like the headlines about, you know, QE for the fourth quarter is getting ramped up and it's being really sterly. We're going to get another rate cut. Like, I mean, these things we knew was coming, but I guess it's all coming a little sooner than expected. And everybody's rushing a little bit to figure out what is going to be the match that sets the house on fire. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, I, this is a potential dynamic I see because it, it's really like what what does dealing with Libra and, and this series of interactions change about their their overall attitude towards these things and it's just it's 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 really it would be really ironic if what really kicked off things imploding and pushed people into Bitcoin was them reacting to and trying to copy Bitcoin Well, whatever it is, it's going to be, yeah, I mean, you know, that's where when that person was just going off and off and off about Libra and it's like at the end of it, he's like, well, it's still good for Bitcoin because people are going to figure out about it. And in and, and that he's correct. Mm. Hey, everything's good for Bitcoin, man. <laughs> All right. If you guys uh, don't have anything else to go on with that, then uh, Janine, you could take us into what's going on with uh, Mr. Cody Wilson. Yeah. So um, I think when was I think it was actually ex almost exactly a year ago. Um, you may remember that we talked about Cody Wilson being arrested on a, I don't remember if it was specifically statutory rape, but that was the, the crux of the charge. It was something similar to that. Um, and if you don't remember that at all, you can see episodes 126 through 128, 
because we talked about it for those three episodes. And long story short, he had allegedly met up with a girl who was 16 years old, just under the age of consent in Texas, through a sugar daddy dating website, and then allegedly proceeded to um, have sexual relations with her. Uh, Never, I don't, I didn't really look for court documents about what, you know, happened over the course of like whether there was any trial or if this plea te- plea deal was worked out relatively early on in the process it sounds like it was um but basically it was announced i think last week by the Travis County Assistant uh District Attorney's office that Wilson had accepted a plea deal for the third degree felony of injury to a child instead of what was originally a second degree felony carrying 20 years or so in prison um, as quoted from Ars Technica, Wilson will serve seven years of deferred um, adjudication, pro- uh, probation, and register as a sex offender. He'll pay a twelve thousand or one th- or uh, wait twelve hundred dollar fine and a four thousand eight hundred forty dollar uh, restitution to the victim. He must complete four hundred seventy five hours of community service and continue to attend sex offender therapy. And during this probation period, his keystrokes will be monitored. He will not be allowed to possess firearms, and he can cannot drink alcohol or use narcotics, and he must inform the court if he has children during that time. Uh, Ars Technica also included a statement that the girl's mother made during the sentencing, where at one point she says, Our daily life was shattered, but she never wavered from the truth. Once she knew who you are and what you did, she never wavered. She remembers the gun you put in her hands and the feeling of your skin. So, I mean, I don't remember the original details of the allegation involving weapons, but I guess she's implying that there was a gun involved in whatever they did, which seems a bit, like, kinky or whatever. Um, but I do find it quite interesting with the mother's statement where she says, once she knew who you are and what you did, she never wavered. Um, I don't know. I mean, again, don't really know if any anything else came out about what the girl's frame of mind was or whether she actually felt coerced or if there was this was really just a statutory rape situation. Um, at any point, but it sounds like the mother is making it sound like this was a politically motivated decision to pursue charges because she's basically in the statement, she was implying that, you know, it was, it was in the interest of the public to put him away or to punish him because he was a dangerous person who might come after them in retaliation, uh, because I suppose it was (laughs) very obvious that he had an interest in the second amendment and, defensive technology uh unfortunately there was a link for a cbs austin article that doesn't seem to be working anymore but from what i can recall it said that the the decision to accept his plea for a lesser charge was made after talking to the girl and her family and they agreed to it um which is definitely a much lighter sentence than he could have potentially faced as i said it was around 20 years in prison if he had been convicted under the um, second degree felony. Um, And I think it's pretty clear that the goal of this lesser charge wasn't really to punish wrongdoing or even to get a dangerous person off the street, because obviously he's going to be on probation. That still means he's going to be able to walk around Austin and all of that. Um, Basically, I think the goal here was to put him in a position where he can't effectively participate in in his own business, he can't use firearms, and he'll be surveilled constantly for the next seven years if he does anything online, which basically he can't do the work that he's been doing if that's the case. And um, if they can achieve that with probation, then that's still a prison in itself for him, even though he's not being locked up. So... I guess that, for now, is the conclusion to this story. Lucky! Like, that, 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 that's, 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 that's my main reaction. Like, holy shit. What he got out of there with, in terms of, of a penalty for that, holy shit. That motherfucker is one of the luckiest people on this fucking planet. 
he could have spent decades in jail and it doesn't matter that like in the grand scheme of things like she was an almost adult girl and not a, a young child like he he would have been fucked with very hard in a prison for that kind of long time period being in there for that reason so like yeah the entire situation was absurd from the beginning but the outcome holy fuck is he lucky well yeah this is where i'm curious i wonder if it had to do with them just like i mean the stepping down from the defense distributed position i guess was like a given whenever it all started but uh yeah, it is just like a godsend that he's not in a prison cell because, yeah, when you enter into this, uh, you know, justice system, however it is, whatever angle it is, it's not really the most, uh, you know, it doesn't really bring that much justice and you're going to get luck. You're just going to be lucky if you can come out unscathed because, yeah, if you go to prison for any period of time, you know, I mean, uh, you can end up in trouble. I mean, what, Epstein was only in there for a couple of weeks, right, or something, I don't know. Anyway, I don't mean to go that direction, but for sure, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's a good thing that he avoided prison on this. It's just hard to imagine him keeping a gun out of his hand for the next seven years or not doing something on the internet. Like, uh, I hope he's got a nice piece of property in Texas to watch the sun sets and sunrises. Yeah, I mean, it's, dude, it's, it's a way better outcome than what could have happened. By a mile. Yeah, everybody gets stressed out whenever there's charges brought against them, even if they're ridiculous charges that you know you'll beat is because there's that risk. And, you know, there was like a lot of political sentiment to try and bring this guy down for what he was doing with the 3D printed gun movement. And uh, at the same time, you know, I guess... Yeah, I mean, that's kind of a fight either way. So, I mean, he's probably got just as many supporters as people fighting against him. But, yeah, he's just coming out unscathed. That's a, that's a good day. Da -da 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 -da. Well, yeah, man, let's, uh, let's go right into what did not, what didn't come out unscathed from these FATF travel but, rule implementations. But, but. But I don't want to. Now I'm going to have to talk for a long chunk of time. Okay. Yeah, you, you got to explain what's going on here, man, because, you know, privacy coins and, and you know, hey, yeah, the privacy wars, they're coming up. So what's going on here? Do, 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 do. Uh, OKX is a uh, Korean subsidiary has delisted Monero Dash Zcash. Zen, which is, I, I'm pretty sure, some uh, stupid fork of, uh, of Zcash um, or a fork of yeah, Zcash or something. Um, and then uh, SBTC, I think that's Super Bitcoin. I don't know. Um, probably, again, at some point, uh, a Zcash fork derivative or something. But the, the important part is that... Um, Transaction support stops October 10th. Um, withdrawal service stops December 10th. And then that's it. And the reasoning behind this was the recent um, FATF decision regarding uh, vast businesses, uh, virtual asset service providers, and the travel rule. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really... Just, I think, the first in a, in a long series of dominoes we're going to see hitting each other and falling since that uh, guidance was put out all, all over the world. But what's really kind of absurd about this is that there's nothing that prevents the travel rule from being implemented with a privacy coin. Like, th things can be, there are ways to reveal things about a transaction to other parties there is you know nothing stopping something like that cipher trace uh second layer protocol from working with a privacy coin so the the logic is kind of just not there this is a completely illogical um decision but it's still it, it shows the general attitude they're not even going to you know associate with 
the, these types of projects just because of the whole nature of this privacy technology being to undermine that type of KYC and surveillance. And so, you know, this is not going to be the last business in this space that does this over the coming six months or coming year. Like, I think we're going to see a lot more of this type of stuff. Dun -na, dun -na, dun -na, dun -na. You know, I, I would really like to like to see the process how such decision gets made because what what they are communicating is almost never is what's really happening. Honestly, I think it's probably something along the lines of is there a risk? Okay, can we cover our ass? Okay, then cover our ass. And then it's it's pretty much that. Okay, X is Hong Kong company, right? Yeah. Um, I think actually, wait. I think so. I always like there's OK Coin and OK X. One was mainland China, one was Hong Kong, but the Chinese mainland one branched out. So this might be. I'm I'm not sure which one of it is. Uh. Yeah, honestly, I, I always confuse those two companies because of the subsidiary structure. Yeah, and as far as I know, they, they, the Chinese companies were relocating to Hong Kong uh, a while ago. But yeah, I, I didn't know that two different things like OKX and OKCoin. Well, that was from before the uh, China exchange band. There was like one of them operated in mainland China and then one of them operated in Hong Kong to be, uh, you know, able to take international customers. And there was like always those two uh, separate houses for that. But I see, I see. Yeah, but this is, you know, I'd, yeah, there, there are going to be a lot more exchanges making changes and decisions like this uh, to come. Yeah, I mean, like you're saying, I mean, it's the privacy war. I mean, and these guys are marketing themselves as privacy coins. And yeah, I mean, that seems like just an easy, like, okay, well, they're obviously risky if we want to try and skirt this compliance of the FATF, it's like, just drop these. And I mean, like, uh, yeah, I mean, like, I don't know where the line is on that, that we should be like, you know, causing an uproar for shitcoin forks that, you know, claim to bring more privacy than uh, what you can do. It, it reminds me to Giacomo Zucco's presentation in Baltic Honey Badger. It's not exactly what happened now, but uh, something similar. He was presenting the case for altcoins and one of the argument he had the for altcoins is that creating altcoins is heroic because the <clears throat> because governments are not gonna let cryptocurrencies go and they are gonna go to jail before us. <laughs> so yeah, it's heroic. <laughs> Yeah, I saw that slot, I think. It's like, uh, you know, it just takes attention off of what is being developed in Bitcoin. And, uh, yeah, I mean, at a certain point, it's like, um, you know, when does that become the practice where it's like, okay, well, we know that they're going to start trying to make sure that all these uh, transactions are going through an implementation like Cypher Trace is creating instead of going through a coin join. But uh, yeah, just, I don't, I don't know when that's gonna be. Yeah, just uh, extend this logic a little bit. Uh, everyone is so afraid that uh, exchanges are going to blacklist uh, mixing transactions. Uh, but you know, they it's easier for them to drop privacy coins first. Right? We are not talking about going to jail. We are just talking about what they are doing now. So. In other words, it's, it's easier for them to blacklist privacy coins uh, than mixing transactions, although this foreshadows that the other one is coming too. So uh, it's not good either way. Yeah, but I mean, like, that seems like it's just a, 
it's a conflict waiting to happen because, I mean, there are groups of exchanges that really want to go the coin join route and not this, uh, you know, let's uh, trace everything route. And, yeah, it'll be interesting to see when, I don't know, I mean, like I'm saying, you know, this is the beginnings of this privacy war where they're delisting coins that they can easily just take the risk off of their back. But uh, at a certain point, you know, it's going to be like an all-out fight, it feels like. I think Francis Puya has a really good um, strategy in that, in that he's effectively going to, like, he's arguing that, uh, at least in Canada, exchanges legally have to mix and use coin joins and stuff because not doing so is leaking private information about their customers publicly. That, yeah. that is, in developed countries with strong legal systems, that is a very interesting potential route to, to take in, in, in dealing with this kind of issue. Yeah, I mean, that is a great way to do it. I mean, like, for me, I mean, I've said this in many discussions, like, there should be a best practice to mix all the transactions, especially with exchanges, because, you know, the liability, like you're saying, on several fronts. And, uh, you know, I have hope. Man, for some places, even within the United States, I mean, you know, Colorado, I'm here in Colorado for a reason. I mean, they passed their own net neutrality laws recently, and they passed the Digital Token Act, which tried to keep scams out of the area. And once they passed that, I mean, the discussion kind of naturally went to like, okay, well, when are we going to start talking about bringing back privacy, you know, and that right to people here in Colorado, but on the internet? So, I mean, you know, the discussions aren't entirely one way, and it gives me a little bit of hope. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, I even met uh, uh, in Riga, I even met an exchange, uh, a guy from an exchange that he, he, he thanked me for, for Wasabi. And he said they are pointing their users to Wasabi because uh, to mix the money before you send it to the exchange, because if you don't, then they may have some 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 shit to do with that but if you do that with wasabi privacy is a human right so so and 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 they definitely won't have problems with that in in the future uh at least you know law enforcement is not gonna knock on their door because they are not getting to their exchange but if they are not mixing that before then they might get some false investigations ongoing and wasting a lot of time on this false investigation. In fact, they are building their own blockchain analysis software, a uh, homegrown one, only because they don't want to share anything with other blockchain on, with blockchain analysis companies. So they want to keep every data inside. Uh, yeah, so that, that's an interesting thing too. Wow. That's really cool. I mean, to hear that and to know that, yeah, it's going on and, you know, I mean, like, yeah, this should become a practice that more exchanges uh, adopt and understand that it just improves the value proposition for Bitcoin and their investors and, you know, helps protect their, you know, their traders. It's, it's a good thing. I mean, all around, the only thing is you got to get over that political nonsense. Anyhow... Let's move on to Casa. I think Shinobi will have some good things mm -hmm. to say about it. Yes, and also I'm going to yell at you first. Uh, put things on the news desk next time because having that square donation to uh, BTC Pay would have fit thematically nice here because <laughs> what I'm really happy about here is that th this is a company that sells their service for money and they pretty much just open sourced the entire design rationale behind their whole service you know like square literally donated to an open source competitor of their business model like hodl hodl it, like recently um, announced they're going to open source their platform so that anybody can spend just that that seeing these businesses in this space appreciate that transparency is important both for just you know being open for users to to see and audit things themselves and also just to encourage that competition that 
in the end results in better shit for everybody and prevents the type of monopolized concentration that distorted markets usually devolve into. And it, it's really a very in-depth, like thought through document. They go through the entire design reasoning for every decision they made in constructing the, the entire service. And like one of the uh, things, you know, maybe not widely known is one of the people involved uh, actually developed the Glacier Protocol. And part of the whole like reasoning for CASA being founded was wanting to take the Glacier Protocol, which is arguably the most secure way to manage your Bitcoin, but is something that literally takes hours and lots of technical knowledge to set up and literally an hour's process to move coins from that storage setup and turn it into something that a normie can set up in a few minutes and benefit from all that security. And they, they really did have to think through a lot of design trade-offs. And like the, the goals they really set out for that at the beginning was really requiring the absolute minimal knowledge of how things work to use it, getting the highest degree of security for that. Like recognizing being able to use it is what makes it secure. Like, you know, PGP. Nobody used it. It was super secure, but a pain to use. You know, having their support there as a service for things. The way that everything's set up redundantly to be, you know, loss proof, but still totally in your control. And then, you know, trying to align the incentives of the company with the users. Like they make money because you pay a subscription fee for all of this support and them participating as a recovery option. They don't make money if they don't keep designing things to keep their customers safe and around. You can just pull out at any time and the whole system leaves them no option to stop you. And you know, as far as like the, the kind of threats that they deal with, like they have thought through like everything, like, you know, the whole, like balanced architecture between being safe from losing things, but also safe from hacking or compromise, you know, was finding that perfect balance between being secure and being loss resistant to deal with the potential that, you know, you can lose things, but you can also be subject to a phishing attack or a SIM hijacking or, you know, network attacks. And like they have the, the whole, section in this breakdown it's like 36 pages where they go through all of this and they're very clear about what they do protect from what they don't protect from and how just their entire design of the service you know leads into why they're able to protect against some things but some things they just can't like you know they don't offer any kind of software uh for managing a wallet delivered through a web browser because that there's a million ways to give you compromised software which could just trick you into sending to the wrong address like the and you know taking that a level further a whole layer down all the multiple hardware wallets from multiple manufacturers that even if you were to somehow be given a compromised app is going to show on that device what it's signing like it's very redundant and then layered and structured to deal with that. And, you know, it, it's the whole reasoning is out there now. So when a competitor comes along that wants to compete with them, at least, hey, that competitor sees a whole model and a train of thought and maybe doesn't go do something stupid just to differentiate from CASA because the whole reasoning and model is out there in the open. And then they also go through, um, you know, a number of things that they specifically didn't do and why they didn't do those things. Like, for instance, um, they have biometric security for the key on your smartphone, but nothing else. And, you know, hardware wallets don't support that. But even if they did, they wouldn't because the more things locked biometrically, the, the bigger the incentive to do something like cut your finger off. And that's a horrible design to create something that incentivizes that. 
And, you know, the, the reason that they don't do seed backups is because, well, you have five keys. That's five extra things that have to be kept track of for this wallet now and an extra spot for keys to be compromised. And, you know, it's really, I think you should look through this and even just like having no interest in using the service, this is a good thing to really make you think through how you secure your keys yourself. And I do, I do want to tack on the end here though, um, something that I disagree with in this document. Um, Shamir's secret sharing, key sharding, is one of the things they rejected and decided not to use as a feature because of the, the complexity and lack of a standard. But Trezor creating a standard for this for HD wallets, I think changes things a little. And I think that they actually should offer key sharding for just one of the hardware wallet backups because in addition with how their mobile wallet already works this exponentially increases the the level of, of shit you can recover from and like they could make that a different tier and charge more for it and you know make sure users know what they're doing before they let them turn it on but if you just have one hardware wallet with uh, Shamir backup, the mobile wallet key um, has an encrypted copy of that key stored on your cloud storage, and the key to decrypt it is held by Casa, so that you can recover that key if you lose your phone, but Casa doesn't know it. And so with that and a Shamir backup for a single hardware wallet, you would be able to lose every single device that you have a key on for your Casa wallet and still be able to recover your funds through recovering the smartphone key and the one hardware device with a Shamir backup. So, you know, that aside though, read this. This is the way you should be thinking about securing your keys. Wow, yeah, man. I saw this on the desk and I've been scanning through it as you've been talking and I'm definitely going to look into it a little bit more because uh yeah like you're saying i mean <clears throat> well i mean casa is one of these companies in the space that just is sort of doing everything right similar to btc pay server and you know some of these hardware wallet companies that are trying to make things a lot more open source and secure for everyone and yeah this is something i'm definitely going to have to dig into a lot more because like some people here in the chat i tried the glacier protocol in the past and it is really complicated for especially when you're just trying to lock up like twenty dollars you know like i was just trying to do it to figure it out and it's like man if i don't have the money for this thing i mean it might not be worth my time but you know you know you got guys like casa building out easy ways for people like us to understand maybe it makes it a lot more feasible mm -hmm. but it's you know it's you know it's like i said though at the, at the start though it's just the, the seeing so many companies in this space take this attitude about internal things that in other markets like companies would keep very close to the chest and not reveal to anybody and like these companies in in the bitcoin space just put that out there to to see criticism to have people build on and improve from it and even just learn from to use themselves and that's like that is what is really going to turbocharge the, this ecosystem in the long term. Heck yeah, man. I'm already thinking about just a line of materials to have for people whenever they want to come in and learn about Bitcoin here in Boulder, and this will be in that lineup for sure. All right. So I guess you're up next, Rick. Oh yeah, man, I am. Let me do this. Let can, me see. Can, I, can I just add the freak note? Because no, I sure. just noticed that uh, so since we are talking about hardware wallet-ish things about security, I just noticed that the quad card multi-sig uh, support has just been merged to Electrum. So mm -hmm. that's that's great news. But okay, the, uh, ahead, the Segwit multi-sig though, which is the yeah, yeah, distinguisher, oh, which is fucking uh, awesome. Uh, not only the segwit, the the old one didn't work either. So yeah. <laughs> oh yay! Yeah.
Heck yeah, man. Companies like CoinKite are doing the right thing. All right, let's talk about some uh, interesting things that have been going on uh, as far as maybe not go doing the right thing or maybe it is the right thing. All right, well, everyone's been talking about, maybe a lot of people I know have been talking about Bitcoin at 10K and the alts have been taking a dump since the run, in, run up in late spring. Well, now Bitcoin's been so stable, people are dabbling back into alts a little. Be careful with what you play with. Most of these networks have unknown vulnerabilities. Like our next story, EOS had a recent exploit exposed that didn't cost too much and it didn't really affect the price either. However, it's pretty damning vulnerability that could be used again in the future unless uh, Dan Lammer and the EOS crew find a fix and plug it in. So it appears the hacker used a flaw in the uh, consensus mechanics with the EOS blockchain and the way they were leveraged in a gambling dApp called EOS Play. The attacker used the Resource Exchange, or REX, to purchase large amounts of computing power to dominate transactions and push winning contracts in his direction, all while congesting the network. They rented some 1.2 million CPU and net at a cost of around 300 EOS, or around $120, to exploit the random number generator for the DAP EOS Play, which is an implementation of EOS IO. The attackers staked all the rented computing power to defer transactions that didn't have winning contracts for themselves. Since the RNG, the random number generator, was built on chain and the entropy used to develop the randomness is from future blocks, the attacker was able to manipulate those random numbers by knowing the next constructed block. In all, in all the attacker used his $120 to net some $120,000 of EOS. That's around 30,000 EOS at the current price of around $4. Now this did grind the EOS play system to a halt and congested network traffic shortly after the attack. And you would think all of this system failure could affect the price, but you'd be wrong. EOS still sits in the top 10 of coin market cap at number 7 with a market cap of nearly $4 billion. And if anything, this shows those networks have had very little trust built into these blockchains and therefore the lack of trust exemplified in these attacks don't have noteworthy effects on the price. We saw this last year with the mining death spiral caused by caused major double spins on lower tier networks like Ethereum Classic with no effect on the price. Currently EOS is still up on the monthly and weekly charts but taking a small percentage point hit in the daily. Dan Lambert commented on the whole situation saying quote Owning and staking EOS gives users a pro rata share of available bandwidth. When people don't use their share, it is redirected to others on a pro rata basis. During heavy use, users no longer receive this free benefit. Lessons learned here is don't design contracts that depend upon extra bandwidth available during uncon uncontested mode. The EOS contract should have a low CPU action to pause execution available to contract maintainers close quote so yeah right now as it stands the eos dap contract has most of its funding still intact which is about six hundred thousand dollars and the attackers contract still has about one hundred twenty thousand dollars in it it's hard to say where it all goes from here the situation is ongoing but uh, we'll be sure to bring any of the updates in the future and the developments to you so uh yeah did you guys have anything to think about EOS and this uh, recent exploit and, you know, what's going on over there in delegated proof of stake land? This is amazing. Like, this is absolutely amazing because, like, I, it was like last year, um, there was the, the whole issue on EOS that, again, it was basically rooted in the architecture. Uh, of people buying the rams to speculate and it just like squeezing resources available on the network to actually do something and it's like this is amazing because this is the exact same kind of you know uh exploit except it's actually being tactically used to manipulate what executes and what doesn't execute on the network so like this type of vulnerability just got taken from like the level of you know you can use it to manipulate uh markets and make money if you are one of the uh 
the leader, whatever the fuck they call it in EOS, uh, to like you can actually manipulate what is or isn't executing on the network. So th this is amazing. It's like the, the whole architecture is, is retarded to just have like a dynamic variable, um, like virtual resource that somebody's in control of defining. Like that's a, it's effectively like the the block size limit. They're like bare equivalent of it. Uh, it's it's retarded to have that. Like you you set that and you leave it alone and you build on top of it based on how that works. It like it does not work when that type of control variable is just a sliding lever. And the, the like EOS is entirely designed to make that a democratically controlled sliding lever. It's it's hilarious. Yeah, I think you were looking for the term block producers, I think. Yes. I mean, like, yeah, I remember this whole argument, too, last year, because I was at this uh, distributed conference here in town, DISCON, and I was backstage with some guys from EOS and Ethereum, and, you know, it was like an interesting conversation between a Bitcoiner and an Ethereum guy and an EOS guy, and... It was like for a moment, the Ethereum, like me and the Ethereum guy were like on the same team. We're like, what, what are you going to do about these block producers just taking over the system? He's, they were just like, look at us. Well, we'll just, uh, we'll figure that out. All right. Anyway, yeah. It's a shit show over there at the shitcoin world. And yeah, this isn't the shitcoin digest. We only talk about exploits when they're interesting. Da -na -na, silence means move on. Da -na -na. Yeah, you got the next one. Why don't you tell us, man? Some big news going on with the Liquid Network and Bull Bitcoin. I think you got some exclusives. What's going on? Yeah, well, it's you know, I I gotta you know give a uh, thanks. Yeah, that's the word. Thanks to uh, Francis. He actually uh, answered some questions uh, real quick before we came on air, and hopefully sometime soon we can actually have them on for a special edition but uh bull bitcoin his uh business in canada is joining the liquid network um not as a federator that actually participates in the consensus process but they are going to be whitelisted for withdrawals so they can uh process uh withdrawals outside of liquid that the network federation boxes will automatically approve and his plans with this are really interesting. Um, so what he's effectively doing um, and planning to do is launch a uh, Canadian dollar stable coin on Liquid and then um, be able to sell that. And you will have to do KYC to get your hands on the stable coin. But the idea is um, that from there, you can buy Bitcoin on Liquid um, and have that KYC kind of removed a layer uh, to the buying the stable coin instead of directly tied to the specific Bitcoin you buy so they can be tracked. And they can process uh, withdrawals out of Liquid as well. So they can get you out of the, uh, the side chain. And then another nice part about that is um, this can be taken to a whole new degree um pretty much traders in canada who can legally trade places like bitmax or bitfinex um, can actually come in um get you know the canadian dollar uh with kyc through them and then disconnect that metadata from the actual bitcoin they buy and then can go trade on these other platforms that integrated uh liquid and then um, instead of having to KYC or, you know, dox themselves uh, past the minimum just to trade with crypto on those platforms, they just pull it back out through Liquid and exit Liquid through Bull Bitcoin. And so like, he's really like, constructing a, an amazing arbitrage uh, regulatorily of KYC and kind of creating you know, these barriers where you can concentrate all that KYC just to buying fiat tokens and with somebody that you trust and still be able to access all these other businesses um, and not leak um, the, the same comprehensive degree of KYC information to them. And so like, the, the, their plan with this is just absolutely amazing. 
I, I, I have to agree. I, I think this is like, I don't know, some, some really, really elaborate planning that you can only see in movies like <laughs> this is this is really interesting I'm, I'm looking forward to it i hope they're gonna succeed mm -hmm. i mean it, it, it's brilliant because it's like it's taking advantage of this federated side chain with total privacy to like just not remove kyc completely but like disconnect the kyc from your bitcoin so that doing kyc does not mean like people can just track those bitcoin forever until you get rid of them and that's just fucking awesome yeah yeah but that that's the point i, I mean that should be the regulatory point of things to oh okay you, you bought bitcoin you got kyc and from there on no one should know jack shit about you <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, it is a good thing to see, you know, a company like uh, what Francis is doing out there, the Bitcoin bull, the bull Bitcoin. Actually, you know, they like all flew out to Baltic Honey Badger and they seem to be really on the roadmap of Bitcoin. And I know that there's like uh, some people that have all these different impressions about different companies and how exactly they're serving different parts of Bitcoin. And yeah, I mean, I think they're doing a good job to try and represent Bitcoin out there. And, you know, if this is something that they can do to try and, you know, help their customers and at the same time, just help expand the network. And it's just an overall a beneficial, you know, thing for not just there in uh, Canada, but also for the network. And yeah, just keep building out this tech and testing it correctly and just seeing how everything goes. And yeah, it's it's a good thing. So, I mean, like, I'm all about it. It'll be good to have him on for a special edition to, you know, try and go through it more with us if, if he can make it. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you know, more businesses start adopting this model. Like, hint, hint. <laughs> all right, yeah. So, you guys want to go into something that we've been talking about a while? Let's move on. All right, guys. Last we spoke about Iran and the mining industry over there was just a couple of episodes back in episode 189, Decentralized Theater. There we were talking about recently ratified directives from the Iranian president, presidential candidate that recognized cryptocurrency mining as a legitimate enterprise that required proper licensing. In that discussion, we mainly talked about how this was causing miners to wrap up their operations in the country and head to more favorable conditions, which right now seems to be Serbia, Russia, Mongolia, and China. That's always open to change, though, and I hear Mongolia might be going through their own little crackdown, so we'll have to see how that evolves. Now, back to the Iran. We have more details on this directive being put forward for the mining industry thanks to some shared transcripts with Bitcoin Magazine. And once again, great to see on the ground reporting over there with uh, the reporter Mazier Motomedi. Uh, great work. Sorry, I destroyed your name there. I'm really sorry. All right. So the details shared with this publication is it looks like people wanting to work in the mining industry in Iran will have to acquire two separate licenses. One will require individuals to provide a business ID and estimates of investments, job creation, capacity, Machine, machinery valuations, and a business plan, among other things. Then the second will require business owners to declare what kind of devices and how many of them they have, what company developed them, and how much power they consume, among other criteria. Both of these licenses will have to be renewed after a 12-month period. Another aspect covered in this transcript is the cost of electricity, which is still a rumor, but confirms the previous rumor. <laughs> the, the price of electricity offered to miners will be equal to the average real price at which Iran exports its electricity to other nations, or 70% of the average real price at which the country ships or exports natural gas. While the prices are not yet actually disclosed, it appears like this will line up somewhere between 5 and 6 cents per kilowatt hour. One of the researchers who spoke with Bitcoin Magazine said, quote, now, there are rumors that the energy ministry is looking at a price of about 6,500 rials, or around 5.5 .5 cents. 
for eight months of the year and a stratospheric price of over 20,000 rials above 17 cents per kilowatt hour for the remaining four warm months that see higher energy consumption, close quote. Then lastly, the cabinet is working to get miners to repatriate their foreign currency yields into Iran's central bank run system called NIMA, N-I-M-A. The NIMA rates offer higher higher rates are NIMA offers higher rates for the real than open markets. So all of this is seen in a couple of different lights in the country. We are happy just to see Iran treating cryptocurrencies with an open attitude to innovate, while others are seeing this as a moment slipping through Iran's hands. Cryptocurrency and blockchain researcher Hamad Salahi said, quote, I think if passed in their current form, the government regulations will mostly eliminate major private players and replace them with state-linked actors, state-linked actors, many of whom still enjoy various forms of sub subsidies. And he says Iran is, quote, throwing itself into a losing game, close quote. So I'm in agreement with Ahmed. It looks like the mining industry going forward in Iran will mostly be state-sponsored. It's hard for miners to remain profitable when there is all this cumbersome regulation and licensing to work with. And uh, yeah, most miners are just going to do what they have been doing recently, which is pick up and head to more favorable conditions. So that's the way uh, it looks like things are turning out officially in Iran. Did you, uh, you guys have any comment on this story? Yeah, I think I think you really hit the nail on the head, and it's uh, it's just really a tough spot to be in. You know what I mean? Like, you cannot just let that that demand go rampant at insanely cheap prices without major consequences. But at the same time, it's like you should be shooting for reasonable checks, not something that seems like you're carving out like niches for anybody that you can regulatorily capture. Dun-na-na, dun-na, dun-na-na, dun, -na, dun, -na, dun, -na, dun, -na, dun well, you know, the mining game is hard, man. I mean, we just had a little bit of mix-up in stories there, so I'm trying to figure out where we're at. But you're right. I mean, the mining game is hard to figure out. And I mean, like, initially, whenever people just start introducing the aspects to where people think that, hey, this is legitimate, it's something that I can start working with, like, I'm going to run over here and set up shop. And then, yeah, we get this where we've had recently in the past few months, this sort of back and forth where the industry sort of figuring out what this has done to the power grid and how exactly, you know, there's some sort of leaks where power is sort of coming out of nowhere and they need to plug all those holes and you know in that they build regulation which drives the miners out and then they got to work with the electricity companies to try and build favorable conditions it's a uh it's an ebb and flow so uh let me just keep moving to where i can try and put us back on target to where we were because uh yeah let me just go through this and we'll get right back on target so okay so while we're on the topic of mining, we should maybe cover a little small victory for some of Bitmain's competitors. Pool and Mining Pool is the group of individuals from Bitmain who were being sued by the company for allegedly violating non-compete agreements with Bitmain. Well, now not only are they competing, but they recently overtook Bitmain's position as the number one size pool, which is a big accomplishment. They were founded in 2017 and went live in July of 2018, and they've steadily been growing their Bitcoin hash rate since then. The article linked says this was only for a short period of time that Poolin ranked above Bitmain's BTC.com, F2 Pool, Ant Pool, and Via BTC. But as current press time or the recording right now, which is uh, September 18th at nearly uh, 3 p.m. Central Standard Time, uh, Poolin is back in the top position with around 13,850 petahashes. And all of this is not just to pat Poolin on the back, but also to show how Bitcoin mining has become more decentralized than early 2018. There's a small image graph in the linked article that shows various colors for different mining pools. And it's easy to see how the hash rate distribution has become much more even between the various parties. And now another story covered, uh, covering about mining is that we've recently hit a new all-time high with an overall hash rate at about 
terahashes. And uh, which we can thank that to all the new, new and more efficient hardware coming online. Well, at the same time, we also reached new all-time highs in SegWit transactions, which that looks like it has more to do with their block adopting SegWit and doing their large transaction groups of about 50,000 per day with SegWit enabled. So, yeah, just a couple of more quick updates on uh, mining stories, and then we can get things back in order. Do you guys have anything to say about pooling or the hash rate or the SegWit transactions? I mean, I think it's just interesting to, you know, watch these as long-term indicators of just overall health and how like people making that kind of capital intense investment are looking at the ecosystem and you know as far as the segwit stuff you know i i fucking hate their block i think that is one of the stupidest things that anybody has ever latched on to like bitcoin it, it's yeah some people love them some people hate them all right, well, Janine, you want to take us into the bigger news of something going on uh, in the world of privacy. Yeah, so yesterday was uh, a big day for Edward Snowden because his new book titled Permanent Record uh, came out. Um, it supposedly reveals for the first time the story of his life, including how he helped build uh, the surveillance system and what motivated him to try to bring it down. Um, it went on sale for the first time yesterday. Obviously, I haven't read it yet because that's not enough time. Um, I was also busy finishing the godforsaken Bitcoin Billionaires book, which included all the trashy theories about Ross Ulbricht. Uh, but apparently, the U.S. Injustice Department has some speedy readers, or at least they read enough of it to decide to bring a civil action against Snowden and his publishers, um, essentially Streisanding themselves, which is hilarious, um, in the action which addresses Snowden and his publishers as defendants. Um, the government from uh, the Eastern District of Virginia, no doubt, writes, the United States of America brings the civil action for breach of contract and fiduciary obligations against defendant Edward Snowden, a United States citizen who formerly worked as a contractor and staff employee for the CIA and was employed as a contract employee for the National Security Agency who published um, and he published a book without submitting the manuscript for pre-publication review and has given speeches without submitting the necessary materials for pre-publication review in violation of his secrecy agreements and non-disclosure obligations to the United States. Uh, furthermore, in the lawsuit it says, Snowden did not at any time submit the manuscript for permanent record to either the CIA or the NSA for pre-publication review nor did Snowden obtain written approval from CIA or NSA prior to sharing manuscripts with Macmillan or prior to the book's publication. Pursuant to the terms of Snowden's secrecy agreements, all rights, title, and interest in any and all royalties, uh, rem I think it should be remunerations, but they spelled it remunerations, and uh, emoluments uh, that have been that have resulted or will result from the permanent record. Um, have been assigned to the United States government. So the really freaky part, besides the fact that they're basically suing him for any money he makes from this book, or the publisher makes from the book, is that they also claim uh, proceeds from uh, anything he earned through the talks or speeches that he's given since 2014. Uh, so they add, pursuant to the terms of Snowden's secrecy agreements, all rights, title, and interest in any and all royalties uh, remunerations, maybe that is a real word because now they've spelled it that way twice, whatever. Anyway, let's just call it earnings. Any earnings uh, from Stone's speeches divulging information in violation of his pre-publication review um, obligations that have been assigned to the United... Ha or from obligations that have been assigned to the United States government. Yeah, well, I guess this is it, guys. We've lost the war. Let's all bow our heads to our surveillance overlords and like obedient little 1984 pawns we should shield our eyes from the material in this book or get get it hypnotized out of our brains yeah fuck no um so the aclu released a statement shortly after um this was announced because it turns out that 
Um, ben, uh, their director for speech privacy and technology, has been advising Snowden, actually, on probably a lot of the consequences of publishing this book. And um, he said, this book contains no government secrets that have not been previously published by respected news organizations. Had Mr. Snowden believed that the government would review his book in good faith, he would have submitted it for review, but the government continues to insist that facts that are known and discussed throughout the world are somehow still classified. Mr. Snowden wrote this book to continue a global conversation about mass surveillance and free societies that his actions helped inspire. He hopes that today's lawsuit by the U.S. government uh, will bring the book to the attention of more readers throughout the world, which is exactly what happened. Um, they also say the constitution uh, or the constitutionality of the pre-publication review system is currently being challenged in court by the ACLU and the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. Uh, so, um, <laughs> as uh, Snowden said yesterday, it is hard to think of a greater stamp of authenticity than the U.S. government filing a lawsuit claiming your book is so truthful that it is literally against the law to write. Um, also, he said, in conclusion, this is good for Bitcoin. <laughs> so, um, speaking of which, I would be super curious to know. Sorry, I think that's a phone ringing. Hopefully, it will stop. I have no idea what that's going for. Anyway. What country ring <laughs> is a, that? It's a it's a goat. <laughs> um, I, I, it's a, it's a digital goat. Um, I would be super curious to know how Snowden has even managed to make some kind of living from speaking at conferences in Europe and the U.S. Because not only does he have to worry about the intelligence agencies trying to obstruct his money because he's a whistleblower, but he's also in Russia, which must be a pain in the ass to send money to. <laughs> Yeah, this this situation is going to be hilarious. Like them doing this, like them suing him is what's going to guarantee this actually does restart this conversation. And then, yeah, I mean, like th this is going to be hilarious when they inevitably put an injunction against further sales and he just starts selling it for Bitcoin. Like it, it, this, this whole situation is just going to be beautiful as it plays out. Yeah, Bitcoin doesn't just fix this. Uh, yeah, what did he say on his tweet? Because I have it pulled up. Or I did have it pulled up. Uh, uh, well, he's made several. So. Well, yeah, this is something that is. Yeah, he said this is good for Bitcoin, but it is also that same meme. Bitcoin fixes this to where, like, yeah, he could get payments in Bitcoin and. You know, just, you know, going back to that earlier discussion, how Cody skirted the law and everything. This is one of those like similar case just to sort of exemplify how the law doesn't really stand that well on its own feet. And uh, this is like you guys are saying, I mean, this is all known information. It's out there. But just the fact that this is going to give it more coverage and people are going to start talking about it again. They do everything in their power to shut it down because uh, they just don't want it to be discussed and they don't want the boats getting rocked and, um, you know, that's what this is doing. And unfortunately for them and just unfortunately in general for this entire side of the argument, it's just like, yeah, it, it sort of just shows like their intention of like how much they really don't want you to have these rights and how much they don't want you know, you to know this information and people are going to look at it and that's going to get them to look at it. Where it's a similar thing where people are like uh, every now and again, we get a press release about somewhere, some place is banning Bitcoin and everybody over there where they weren't looking at it before all of a sudden is looking at it. So it's a uh, it's something that I guess eventually, you know, all the cards will kind of play out the way they're supposed to play out. But yeah, this just goes in that same vein of like, you know, they're. There is not really much of a system of justice here, but I mean, like, yeah, you can see that sort of exemplified in stories like this. Yeah, so I don't, I don't actually, like, this kind of shows me that the government actually doesn't, like, this is, this is like the peak concern trolling moment, because unless they're complete idiots, which is entirely possible, but unless they're complete idiots, they must have known that publishing this lawsuit on the same day that the book was going on sale and obviously like it was like peak marketing day 
they must have known that this would increase eyeballs on the books. So basically what they decided is that the amount of money that they could seize is from, you know, the earning whatever earnings from the publisher or to himself. They basically decided that whatever money they could seize was worth more than the national security risk of people reading this book, which like seriously, you you're basically saying like national security breaches are fine as long as we get money. Uh, yeah, it's that that that's it's like yeah, the whole thing is fucking hilarious. <laughs> but it's just like the the next step though, obviously, is like an injunction to stop sales. So <clears throat> like if you want a visit like ah, I feel like I'm being a patsy in a marketing ploy. But if you want a physical <laughs> copy of the book, I would get it very soon because that is like the no-brainer next step is get a court injunction against sales. I mean, it's, look, Shinobi, if if they actually do that, which, which they may be stupid enough to do, but there's this thing called ebooks and the idea that someone is not going to just like create a very easily shareable, torrentable copy like that's going to happen it's if it hasn't already happened i would be surprised but this book is going to get out there so if the like the harder they try to get this on a banned book list like the more people are going to read it that's pretty much what happens with every banned book do you mean the government has people in it that are so stupid they literally show mark zuckerberg a picture of memes and ask him if russia made them <laughs> Well, like I said, these people could be complete idiots. I'm not ruling that out, but they would have to be complete idiots to not understand the consequences of that. Or, you know, they're just like, you know, they're like any normal, you know, half-brained person who cares more about money than these supposed goals of protecting the nation and all of that shit. Like, that's just... This is all just concern trolling. They don't give a shit about any of that. They they just want to make money off of this because they think they can. And, you know, whether they end up getting, you know, the money from Snowden is one question, because obviously he's in a different country. I wouldn't be surprised if they managed to get it from the publisher, because, you know, the publisher is in a bit of a tricky spot, being based in the U.S. and everything. But, like, I, like the idea that they didn't think of this, like the publisher and Snowden, the, de- the idea that they didn't think that this could happen, they probably discussed it at length months before the book was published, and they probably have contingencies about, oh, yeah. like, the publisher probably priced the chances of this happening in, and so I don't think they're going to suffer that much. And also, like, the, like it's the way Snowden's talking about Bitcoin and bringing this up, like, I, there, there is no way that he did not uh, guarantee that there were physical copies of that book like somewhere that the, the US could not have them seized to keep selling for bitcoin like i like th- there's no way he was like so stupid to not do that but then yeah, you have and to also part with your bitcoin so buy them now yeah also hint hint to the intercept this would be a really good time to stop hoarding the rest of those documents that snowden Naively, naively or otherwise gave you stewardship over you know probably a good idea I concur well, that's been a long time coming well yeah it's just uh, crazy to think about like that they're gonna just try to make money off of Snowden and his stories and yeah at the same time I think it's a lot of just you know they just want to keep that discussion away from the public but Let's go on. Let's go on to something that everybody's favorite topic. Let's move out of the world of privacy and crazy governments and the way that that whole incredibly interesting dynamic is playing out and move on to everybody's favorite topic, Bitcoin ETFs. That's right. So recently we had a special edition with VanX Digital Asset Strategist and Director uh, Gaber Gerbrix. This there, uh, there we discussed VanX proposed offering to institutional players using the 144A exemption rule. And uh, that offering was released just a few weeks ago. And since they have 
and since they have traded one basket of four bitcoins and that could be the first basket of many since this offering doesn't have to fulfill all the sec's requirements for a bitcoin etf in fact that's why we're talking about this subject again the cboe withdrew its vanex SolidX bitcoin etf proposal on september 13th this marks the second time this year they've withdrawn their proposal the first being from a government shutdown back in january and this one I think it has more to do with them. They just found the appropriate route around the SEC. The product currently being offered is for institutional investors, entities with at least $100 million in assets owned or invested. That's what that means. But these are the baby steps necessary for the SEC to finally approve one of these exchange-traded products. Venek, head of ETF product, Ed Lopez, said, quote, We... We still strongly believe the marketplace and many investors would be better served to have a regulated product out there. And this is just one small step towards that. And right now it happens to be only available to institutions. Close quote. Then Gabber tweeted out with the story, quote, We are committed to support Bitcoin and Bitcoin focused financial innovations. Bringing to a market a physical, liquid and insured ETF remains a top priority. We continue to work closely with regulators and market participants to get one step closer every day. Close quote. So for right now, it looks like this might be the last time Venek SolidX have to withdraw a proposed ETF. I mean, hopefully the next time it's filed, there will be more clear guidance on how to best structure it. For right now, we do still have two other ETFs proposals being reviewed. The Wilshire Phoenix ETF that includes Bitcoin and Treasury, U.S. Treasury bonds. That has its initial deadline at the end of September. Then there's the Bitwise ETF that's said to be either approved or rejected on October 13th. Who knows how this game will play out? I mean, I'm pretty sure we're going to see either a uh, rejection or another withdrawal or another refiling or, you know, hell, maybe there's a shooting star and Bitwise gets approved. I, I doubt it, though. But, yeah, so uh, Van Eck removed their ETF proposal and it looks like they're doing pretty good with this uh, basket offering. So yeah, do you guys have any comments on this story? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I think we're gonna have to get uh, Gabor back on here and ask, uh, you know, what's going on with this and what's their game plan because last time they withdrew was to reassess thing and make a bunch of changes and not have a ticking clock run while they do that. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know, just the motivation behind it, I would imagine, has to do with the fact that they know it's going to be denied and that they've already got this product up and rolling. So, like, you know, why not just focus on the product that you have rolling right now? Mm -hmm. But, yeah, we can, we can ask him on, man, see if we can figure out a little bit more details about it. Or at least grab a quote from him. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. You want to take us into something uh, a lot more interesting? It looks like uh, Blockstream's doing something. Yeah. So um, w one of these is a little old, uh, but the other one was just released yesterday. Uh, Blockstream has their employees doing a medium post series on plugins that they've designed in-house and you know i just kind of wanted to go through this and we'll probably touch on the, the other ones in the series as they're released but you know it's this i think like is is really going to illustrate how useful c lightning's plugin architecture is you know, I know I went on a long ramble uh, when they first announced that and then we covered it. But it's it's the perfect architecture going forward. And like I think Rusty uh, Russell shows with the, the first plugin like exactly why. Uh, it's literally just uh, the summary plugin. And what it is is a general purpose like stats uh, function for the node. So like, you know, everything is built into uh, the RPC and the, the, the command line, but getting different information about different things is a, a bunch of different commands. And so he compiled a plugin that literally just grabs all of this and gives him like stats as he wants displayed how he wants. 
and, and customize that. And it, it spits out the, the node address, um, the number of UTXOs it has on chain, the, the value of those UTXOs, the number of channels, um, the number of connected nodes, and the balance um, available inwards or outwards in the channel. And it also has a nice little display uh, uh, spit out in an ASCII table that graphically shows how different channels or channels are balanced. So you can literally see visually uh, like which side uh, the balances are displayed on. And it's just, you know, the fact that like this whole like core daemon to run the lightning functions is set up that you can just do this and plug this in and have all of this information displayed exactly how you want to. It's like completely customizable. Like this could be built out into a whole like you know whatever use case you're doing this for like a whole command panel specifically geared for that and the, the core software is designed you know specifically to facilitate that and then the the one announced yesterday uh by christian decker is a uh a probe plugin that he wrote and pretty much what this allows um <clears throat> the node to do is uh you know, gather, actively gather information about the network around it. And, you know, there, there's a little bit of a downside, but, you know, I agree with uh, Decker that the, the trade-offs, I think, are worth it. So what this does is this attempts to route a payment somewhere. Like, you know, just any random point in the network, you can just try to route a payment there. But the, the problem is you need the invoice to route the payment. And so what it does is it just generates a scramble, like a, a nonsense uh, payment route proposal with a gibberish uh, free image for the hash lock that the node generates itself and routes that payment. And that'll go through all the way until it gets to the node you're trying to route through if, if it can route there. And then that node will go, I don't know what this pre image is and drop it and the payment will fail. But the, the key is that this, this allows you to see how these payments would, would play out and really map the connectivity of the network in detail. And it also allows you, like, if a payment fails, um, there, there's a built-in function so that it will take that path that the payment took and it will try the path over and over again with one hop towards the end removed to find where it failed. So this is like the, the perfect type of like, you know, information gathering uh, behavior or protocol, I guess you could say, uh, on the Lightning Network. And this is like going to be crazily useful for routing nodes. Like you can use this to isolate bad connections around you and know not to use them or like see where a source of that bad connection is in terms of the closest node to you. And if it's if you know the node right next to you is linking you to all these bad connections you know close that channel and link to a better node like this is exactly what you need to really make sure you are optimally set up as a routing node and again like this whole thing is facilitated by just the general plugins architecture of c -Lite. and so i i'm really interested to see what the rest of the things they've developed that they're going to be writing about are because you know there's a whole lot of potential things you can do with that degree of customizability in the client it's 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 fucking awesome and sadly i will not get my blockstream show paid today because this wasn't the first story we covered so uh oh well, it is still really cool. I mean, uh, you know, I don't really uh, want to pretend like I know everything about the Lightning Network. I do know that there is a lot of developments going on there on a regular basis. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just good to see that development continuing to be built out. I mean, uh, hopefully, you know, we'll have uh, some uh, Lightning developer on the special edition sometime soon we could talk about you know some developments that they're working on but yeah i mean it's good to just see these developments coming out of everybody so good to see mm -hmm. so uh i guess should we slide along mosey forward 
Yeah, man. Why don't you tell us, like, what's going on with uh, with Bisk and some end to end stuff? So uh, Bisk has made a major update uh, two days ago uh, to their arbitration system. And this involved building a end-to-end -end encrypted messaging system over Tor into BISC. So now, um, you know, traders uh, on both sides of a trade can actually directly communicate securely, privately, directly in the platform whenever any kind of uh, dispute comes up. And they've also, um, in addition to this, created the new role of a moderator. And so a mod, or I'm sorry, not a moderator, a mediator. And a mediator can be brought into um, this dispute resolution process um, to deal with the two participants before the actual arbiter steps in, who has the multi-sig key in the escrow. So they've now introduced this, this new step where somebody who does not have a key for the escrow, uh, for the Bitcoins involved, um comes in and tries to resolve it just through you know social communication and you know potentially if this has a, a decent success rate that massively improves the scalability of this whole resolution system because the arbiters who actually control the key and have to make a final decision if the two traders can't agree to one um, only has to come in when these mediators can't actually solve the problem. And so like you, you've created this whole buffer zone now between traders and the arbiters that will still eventually get to the arbiter dealing with things if they have to. But if those mediators can maintain a decent success rate, will massively increase the, the amount of stuff that a single arbitrator can handle. And you know this is a pretty awesome design change as far as things go with a platform like this. And I'm I'm really interested to see like how well this works because you know it ultimately comes down to how successful are those mediators at resolving trader disputes uh, without having to involve the arbiter. And if they can be very successful, then this will be very helpful for this whole platform scaling in the long term. Yeah, I mean, geez, BISC is one of those really important projects, and it's just, I mean, it's great to see it still, you know, chugging in the right direction and getting all these developments done with, uh, you know, Manfred stepping away from the project and the token sort of just taking over, and I mean, uh, yeah, this is just, you know, extra, yeah, something that definitely the network needs, and I mean, I'm looking into, you know, this story, I started digging through some tweets and now I'm seeing some information about an update they're releasing and how they're taking some of the trade limits off through certain denominations and how uh, BISC users in Japan can do certain transfers. It seems like they are really, really, you know, going for this, uh, this development that's necessary as far as getting people in without having to go through KYC and they're really, really taking that process on uh, seriously. And so, yeah, it's a it's good to see that the project's moving forward and that it's going in a positive direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you guys know that Viz, who tweeted about this, he is actually one of the founder of VSEC Blockchain Analysis Company. That's mm -hmm. why the name Viz. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right. right. So I guess Janine, you are up with the final story of the day. Yeah. So in an absolutely surprising, unanticipated move, Coindesk, 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 <laughs> 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 whatever, uh, they have announced via none other than my tech crunch arch nemesis, John Frickin Biggs, who runs or did run his own ICO review newsletter when he doesn't even know what a hard fork is. Uh, that they will be, quote, moving into office space in the same building as the parent company, Digital Currency Group, or DCG, a transition that will take place in March 2020. In an email sent to employees, his first ever to Coindesk's entire staff, wow, 
DCG founder and CEO Barry Silbert of Where's Barry fame uh, outlined four reasons for the move, vowing that while seeking to create new business synergies, oh God, that word, with the media company, one of three wholly owned subsidiaries, the parent uh, would continue to respect and strengthen the editorial independence of the publication founded in 2013. The other two subsidiaries, Grayscale Investments and Genesis Trading, uh, are already working out of the DCG office building in Manhattan. Um, of course, uh, some staff within Coindesk were not happy about this decision uh, because imagine that you are working under the pretense that you are in an independent media company and then you receive an email telling you when, not asking you if, you should be moving into the same office building as your parent company. That smells exactly like independence to me. <laughs> not. Uh, according to the announcement... Uh, the move is seen as a break from the historical geographic separation between the two firms, obviously not financial or any other kind of independence, um, as outlined by Coindesk's editorial policy, which reads, we work in separate offices and maintain strict policies on editorial independence and transparency. In, an, in a dissenting email that was supposedly signed by more than half of Coindesk's employees, 29 out of 50, they claim that uh, the costs to this change um, include, the include the possible reputational damage to Coindesk, a deterioration of reader trust, and an <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that, and, and an opening for competitors to undermine our standing as the industry's leading news provider. Oh, <laughs> <I> <laughs> What? <laughs> uh, okay. Anyway, moving on. Um, the move would also make it harder for us to recruit and retain top talent. <laughs> and it would make it more difficult to work with diverse sources across the industry who may not want to attend a meeting in the same building as DCG. End quote. Um well, I don't know whether Coindesk has much of a reputation or a reader trust we're saving. Uh, it is absolutely true that this will deteriorate whatever remains. Uh, it has been suggested to me more than once that I should write for Coindesk, and my answer has always been, I will not work for a news organization that is owned by the Digital Currency Group, and I will especially not write for an organization owned by Digital Currency Group that shares frickin' office headquarters with them. And um, I will also definitely not work for a news organization, uh, crypto or otherwise, that blocks archive services, such as Coindesk now appears to be doing, uh, because I try to archive the announcement in the news desk instead of providing a direct link. Uh, but Coindesk seems to be blocking those. So no thank you, banky bros. Damn. Nice. I see Jenny writing a tweet right now. This is lies, Coindesk. My trust in you is broken. I will make you obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh... I should totally do that. I you should. Totally... I won't say trust is broken because I didn't have trust to begin with, but <laughs> I yeah, will be... totally I... do that. Yeah. There is Create like, a new I company, doubt... BTC Desk. <laughs> I Excuse me, BRB that... live tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that I could like come up with more than five of those 50 employees that are competent journalists like i doubt i could i could do that well this is where it's like like <laughs> wolfie wolfie zao is like the only person there I, I can think of off the top of my head who i would call a competent journalist well, this is where it's like, dude, you just talk about competent journalism in this day and age. Go find it anywhere. It's hard to find. But, I mean, like, luckily we do have people like Janine who's working on revision control journalism and trying to bring better standards to the space. It's just like, you know, we reported on the block not too long ago and all the problems that they just recently went through. And it's just been, you know, it's just, it's journalism. It's the state of journalism. It's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. But yeah, let's let's see what comes of, of Nopara egging egging things on. Let's let's see. But yeah, CoinDesk is uh this is a joke. 
Like, uh, I think Papa Barry just wants to be able to walk downstairs and, and glance through articles before they get printed. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I can't imagine being in that office building. I mean, like, really, can you think of any, any other? Like, what, what, what are the reasons? What's the reason? No, I know. I mean, like, yeah, they're going to be doing a lot of shitcoin talk in the elevators of that place. Oh, man. What you going to do? All right, well, I guess. Obsolete them, yeah. Uh, Hopefully, we will. All right. Well, I don't know. uh, How's that live tweet going, Jimmy? Or or I think we're just about at the uh, the final thoughts. uh, Thoughts? I'm oh. working on it. Well, yeah. Well, Drafting a tweet. I think we're there. Who's got some thoughts? <laughs> I got one that, yeah, I started it off talking about, uh, you know, the leaves are changing a little bit. We got the last days of summer coming on to you right now. I mean, uh, we'll be putting this out tomorrow, which is Thursday. So that just leaves you Friday and Saturday to get out there and do something. Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. I guess Monday is the start of fall. So get out there and enjoy the last days of summer. That's it. No para. Think. I command you. <laughs> so I just want to say that after three years of working in Wasabi, and one year of working with other people on Wasabi. Finally, we have an office. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. Woo! Addresses are security holes. <laughs> <laughs> are you, are you got a P.O. You box. You got, a, you got a thought? You got a thought? You got to load your thought? You got to load the thought? Uh, Ooh. well... <laughs> In, well, in an update on the uh, Julian Assange situation, uh, I don't I think it was like last week or something, um, a judge announced that even though Assange will be coming to the end of, well, I'm not, yeah, it should be 52 days, so that should have been only about two months or so. Um, Assange was originally supposed to serve, I think, 52 days for the breach of bail uh, sentence. And a judge has said that he will not be released from Belmarsh prison at the conclusion of that sentence because they fear the risk of absconding. So he's going to remain in Belmarsh now under the condition that he's in, he obviously anticipated to go to an ex, some kind of extradition proceeding or extradition trial. And so that's how they're justifying keeping him in prison. So you, that's you- pr- pretty shitty. Are you fucking kidding? He's going to abscond. He's, what fucking airport? What what fucking ferry terminal? What beach could he go on to swim across the fucking English Channel from that somebody is not going to recognize him? Are you fucking kidding me? Well, not even that, but like, what country would allow him to use their embassy for asylum? Because even back in 2012, he was lucky to get the asylum granted at the Ecuadorian embassy, but there really was no other countries that were going to accept him. And he, like, he got that after trying for years and years, um, even before and after he entered the Ecuadorian embassy to find another country that would offer him some kind of degree of safety. Uh, that's not going to happen. And even if he did get asylum, that just means he's going to be stuck in another another shittily small embassy somewhere in the UK, which is not so much different from prison. Uh, and there's no freaking way that even if he was given asylum, that any country would make the effort to try to transit him out of the country because... Any surrounding country in the UK would just say, you know, we declined to let you go through our airspace, which is what, I mean, the US legally, in my opinion, 
uh, violated, you know, the sovereignty of, I think it was Austria or something, when they grounded a South American president's plane just because they thought Snowden was on board. So the idea that they're going to be able to get Assange out of the UK is like, yeah, so the absconding fear is completely stupid. But of course, they would rather keep him in Belmarsh as a statement and make everyone you know, every potential whistleblower afraid. But other than that, yeah, it's just stupid. These are all vindictive assholes. Mm. All right. Well, I guess my uh, my final thought is I'm going to try for the next week to do a sprint with Shy256 videos every day or other day, and you fuckers better watch them because I'm going to try and burn through a queue of topics I have and then start doing a bunch of I can't think of any way to put them but videos about very long-term lightning network stuff and I think I'm probably gonna piss off a lot of lightning network people with that so watch these you fuckers mm, right I would also like to say that I have made my tweet <laughs> Retweet yeah. Janine's tweet. Alright, so I guess that does it. See you guys later. Later, everyone. Adios. Bye bye. <laughs> Yeah, you can have a voice, you're